You are about to receive messages that may be harmful to your mental state. Your sense of reality will be questioned. Your view on things will be altered. You are now part of the Meta. The Meta controls everything. The Meta determines what will and will not happen. You are watching The Meta Show. Hello, hello. We are Hi. here, and it is another meta show. It uh, is. I'm delighted that we have uh, both Sadus and Wibla with us, and a new subscriber already. Darth Kill, two year hype. Congratulations, dude. Hit the big 24 month mark. Hell you, yeah. You, you know what's interesting, Mittens? You uh, interesting. you have a really bright white natural light hitting like the side of your face, so you look really more pale than normal. I'm extra vampiric today. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes, that's the best way to put it. Z man, subscribe. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, it's uh, I have like three monitors here, sort of around me, and so if I lean over here to look at chat on my laptop, I get like extra, oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, extra white. I, I uh, wow, we're getting a, a lot of subs here. Uh, Mech one hundred and one V ten months. Thank you very much. So yeah, we've got a an interesting show here today. There's been a, a lot of chaos in the north. Uh, of basically a lot of the Imperium's foes trying to kill each other. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we just have lots of like random bits of drama. Uh, we have Sadus here. Uh, we have Wibble here. This is Wibble's first time. Wibble, of course, is the autocrat in charge of TNT, yeah. the Imperium Alliance. This is and, the first time uh, we've ever had a TNT guy, period. Hell yeah. Wibble, uh, welcome to your meta show, Cherry. Well done. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, actually, uh, Wibble, before we get started here, Wibble, why don't you uh, introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself, and, and get stuck in. Well, you know, I'm uh, leading this uh, small alliance that lives in Delve, and uh, we like to shoot blues. That's pretty much what I do. I, I do believe you have a titan called uh, Kill Blues, is that correct? Or something uh, along the lines of that? No, we have, uh, well, I have three titans right now, and they're all named 1-800-SHOOT-BLUES. <laughs> See, we had. <laughs> I was just gonna say we had a, a discussion at Vegas about uh, extending the Dark Ochre rule to more areas of uh, Delve, which for people who aren't in the Imperium is like one of our weird like mining regulations, uh, simply such that uh, Wibla could uh, doomsday more people who were caught uh, breaking the rule. Uh, uh, yeah, he has a hunger for Rourke Walls. <laughs> at Vegas this year, I tried to get like, I tried to get a uh, intoxicated Wibla to go up to Merkel Chat and convince him to do the. Uh, the the find system that Wibble used to do, where he would find people for like violating uh, stupid rules, like getting killed in a carrier because they were dumb. <laughs> Shit like that would I be actually, great. It'd make Delve better. I did again. actually talk to him about that, but you know, it was more in the form of, "Whoa, did you hear this?" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I actually used to find people for that shit before, but it kind of got old. It's better to shoot them. Yeah, people don't really respond to fines as much as they respond to getting doomsday. All that money. NGSA would love that money. Anyway. Well, so the plug. thing is, if, if the fine doesn't overcome the amount of risk that people are taking, the amount of money they're making, they're just going to keep doing it. So, shoot blue. Mm, that's a good point. This, this is true, ship. yeah. Uh, so, well, hi, I mean, Sadus. Yeah. Sadus. You... Hello, everybody. How is everyone doing this fine morning? Morning? <laughs> you mean afternoon? <laughs> Going on evening? Didn't our clocks go back yesterday? Uh, I, I don't, don't remember. I think that happens tomorrow or tonight today. I I... Stupid oh daylight savings time. <laughs> yeah, <no one laughs> stuff is... Ah, tonight! Hyper says tonight. Hey, cool! Our other guest has arrived! <laughs> And we Hi, have Dark Shines. Uh, Dark Shines here. Actually, Dark Shines, uh, it's good to have you on board. Can you introduce yourself for uh, everybody who might not know? Who... Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Dark Shines. I'm in uh, FC in the initiative. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Like Yay! Titans. He likes Titans. Uh, uh, so actually, uh, why don't we start with uh, Dark Shines was going to come on today to talk about a funny little story of something that went down. Uh, should we just segue there? Yeah, let's there... go into that. That's gonna be a great start because I, I want to. I've wanted to talk about this for a while because it's something that's uh, of personal interest to myself. Uh, this is like the dream of uh, frigate flying is to use frigates to obliterate a titan, and uh, our our boys in initiative and initiative mercenaries have pulled it off. 
uh, in the drone lands. And so uh, Dark Shrine's here to tell us all about how the hell this came about. How the hell did you pull this off? Stuka Fleet, right? Yeah, I believe it's called Stuka yeah. Fleet. Take it Go away. Ahead. Tell us. Please. <laughs> yeah, so um, Stuka Fleet is, uh, depending on whether you want to believe Reddit and Test or not, it's uh, one of Panda's um, love child thingies. He uh, has hounds and micro jump, and he likes to cause as much chaos as possible. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, or well, last week, I think, we found um, a nice little system down at the end of uh, uh, back space nowhere. I'm not sure actually what region it was in, Kate. And uh, at the time, they managed to um, get the Rorquals away from our fleet. Um, so we have been going back there a couple of days a few different fleets to try and catch them and today we caught them. Um, nice. Managed to find a wormhole, a couple of jumps and uh, tackled five oracles I think. And then like last time they had warped in some titans and we managed to tackle a titan this time. We were, we were ready for it. And uh, yeah, two, one, one titan unfortunately managed to warp away but the other one, um, the other one got hard tackled and, and died to the Stuka fleet. Yeah, I have now, to... what is it about it that uh, that makes a Stuka fleet a Stuka fleet? Like, I, looking at the battle, uh, not knowing about the mechanics, you you know you do see a lot of command destroyers here for bushing, uh, which is you know one of the classic things that Initiative came up with was snatch fleet, right? Which would basically bounce in and steal a hostile FC, boost them away from their fleet, and murder them. Uh, could you just sort of describe? hopefully in a way that's not too OPSEC, what is Stuka Fleet that makes it different from just a pile of bombers, and why did this work? Well, obviously, bombers have been around for years and years and years. Um, they do decent t uh, DPS with torps, but obviously they can write, wreak havoc uh, with the bombs if, if you know how to play. Uh, so it's a bit un unconventional, I think, from how you would usually fly a bomber fleet, uh, in that... Uh, we don't cloak on grid, we kind of chill on an anchor, and uh, Pando is a master basically at positioning with the micro jumps. So you can, there's, there's quite a few videos there, but basically you, you micro jump around until you're happy with the positioning, uh, and then you bomb <laughs> and watch fleets disappear. It's, uh, so, it's a very So it's like it's a spear fishing fleet at that point. Yeah. Not, not really. You do, well, you, you don't take anyone with you, you, you don't want to be on zero. Uh, which I guess is what spear fishing is, but um, you just, you know, if a fleet warps in, you you get to dictate the range because you can micro jump away and then micro jump back in, and and then when they're at that range, you just bomb them or torque them to death, as was the case with the Titan. What's what's great about this, and he's being very modest, is that it's like a third evolution of bombing. The first evolution was hide your bombers, hope they don't get noticed, obliterate enemy fleet when they appear. Uh, People knew bombers would be coming. Eve has added new things to prevent bombing. Then you had Goku Fleet, the second evolution, which was run around on grid as fast as you can, throw bombs at people. They know you're coming, but they can't really do anything about it because you just have so many of them. We saw that happen to Horde during the Dread Bomb, where like 200 test bombers just charged straight at them, right? They shot as many as they could, but they couldn't kill all of them, and then they eventually died. Uh, and then this is the third evolution, which is instead of charging straight at them and having to burn 100 kilometers, you just jump on top of them. And it takes the Stork, which is the, the best ship in, in EVE right now, and just puts you right on top of them. So it's like it's like the third evolution, the third uh, bit. It's awesome. Yeah, I'm kind of I mean, curious about uh, about how long did it take for this Titan to go down? How long would you say this entire... With that many bombers, was it, uh, was it rapid? Did it take a while? Tell us about that. Uh, well, they got dragged into a drag bubble 400 kilometers off. We micro jumped up, which again is, is another fantastic thing. There's nothing too far away uh, for a Stuka fleet. Um, uh, the Titan itself lasted probably two minutes or so. Maybe wow. a little bit. Uh, obviously, bombers, they have void bombs, and as a shield super with no passive. Uh, Resists as soon as he as soon as he got capped out, he melted. So. Oh, that's gonna hurt, yeah. Yeah. Uh, another thing too about this Titan, I wanted to ask, what did you think of his fit when you saw it? Because I'm looking at this going, what the Christ? Like it's bad. It's really bad. <laughs> it's very bad. It's not that bad. Well, it's okay. A bit weird. He's got a stasis grab. Well, let, let him say what he thinks about the fit. Oh yeah, go ahead, please. 
<laughs> uh, well, I mean, the avatar that it worked in. So we've been in that system two or three times, and each time we've been in there to tackle the Rorquals. And to, to be fair to these guys, they're actually quite good at getting the Rorquals free. Everything from the mobile uh, micro jump units to uh, to warping in their own type. The avatar that they've warped in the last time had absolutely no problem um, tracking our uh, our Stukas, which is, which is a bit strange. Uh, and it looks like that's exactly what the, the Ragnarok was set up for. They waited on their Fortisar, um sorry, they waited on their Fortisar for quite a while before they decided to warp in. Um, with the Oracles in panic, they, they, they came in. So obviously he had time just to, uh, to set up to try and counter it. This guy has an interesting history uh, yeah. looking at it. Somebody put it out in chat. Let me, let me teach you about this guy. He, so, he's even lost a Vanquisher. He's in, lost uh, four back Titans. In June. Yeah, he's lost four Titans. What this guy Six, does, apparently. when when Fortazars first came out, he parked his Titan on a Fortazar in the drones with two fax machines and said, come at me, and wiped out a 200-man subcap fleet and then Moon walked out. Like, this guy buys really nice fit Titans and does incredibly crazy things with his Titan. Usually he lives, but occasionally he will die. Like, once a month, two or a couple of months, he'll die. But he uses his Titan just about as much as people do in Delve, but doesn't have any fax machines to really protect himself like you'd expect Delve to have. So, yeah, it's pretty crazy to watch. He There's a, one battle report where he just wipes out an entire Tengu fleet uh, with a couple other guys, and it's just... Hilarious. Yeah, loss. so it looks like it looks like there's six losses here. This is his sixth Titan loss on his uh, yeah. loss uh, board. Of, of, uh, allegedly, he is a well-known botter, says uh, Albion News 24. Yep. Hmm. Makes a lot of money and then buys a Titan and then flies it till he dies and repeats. And that's what he's known for. Yeah, so it was really interesting to see. He died. Uh and the way he died. Were you guys good. specifically hunting him, like uh, Dark Giants? Did you guys like know like this was this dude? This is what he was doing. Like, did you did you have an uh, idea of who you were going? No, we knew we knew that there was going to be supers and titans. We we didn't realize it was going to be him specifically. Uh, hmm. Someone in Fleet mentioned he's the he's lost. He's now lost the most titans in Eve. I, I don't know if that's true. Yeah, not, he's the he single highest. Wave. Before him, it was five. Yeah. Uh, honestly, we actually wanted the Avatar because. Um, it's it's the avatar who has been thwarting us the the last few times. Um, unfortunately, this time the rag was just a better target, and the avatar managed to get away. They are quite good at killing Dick. We just didn't have enough to hold both of them down. When they they came in, they bumped. Uh, it was actually quite funny because we, we void bombed the rag, uh, and the rag started BFGing towards us, but we were a little bit away, so we were fine. But <laughs> then he bumped off the. Um, he bumped off the avatar, so all our void bombs missed, and the BFG came flying towards us, so we had to try and get away slightly quickly. Yeah. Yikes. To give you an idea about this uh, group, uh, the group is called uh, Red Guard Inc., and they're in uh, Dot and Balance. They've lived in the drones pretty much forever. But unlike 99% of the drone people, these guys are considered dangerous on Z Kill Board at an 81%, which is something that just doesn't happen in the drones. They only have 130 people, yet they are routinely obliterating enemy gangs that come to their space. Um, these are the kind of people you'd want to have in Delve, because they would so, make Delve great again. So, Boat, who has the second most? Is that Sword? Or who has the second most Titans killed? Do we... uh, I think it's still Molly with five, but I'm not I, sure. I think it should still be Sir Molly. Yeah, yeah Molly had Stally's four. Excellent, recently. thank you. He had four until recently, and then Molly there. lost one like a year or two ago that made his fifth, but I don't know of any others. Mm. Yeah, I can't we think of anyone else that's got a higher amount. I'll have to look into it. Uh, but this is a great segue, to, speaking of Titan losses, this is a great segue to uh, something that we talked about last week, but we didn't know the details, and we have found out more details. We had Kendar on last week to tell us about a Satio that he killed, uh, but shortly uh, after the show ended, a couple days later, we find out that that Sotillo had a special surprise inside it. Uh, some investigation uh, work by a guy who was uh, a member of Horde Vanguard and a couple other people have found out that that Sotillo dropped the exact amount of materials used to build a Komodo. Not all of those stuff that you would need to build a Komodo, but like the pieces. For example, I think one of the, the pieces was 666 drone 
blocks and like only the Komodo needs that many. You wouldn't have a stack of that many for any other ship in the game. Uh, so they did the work and found that uh, Horde's first uh, Komodo must have been in build in that Sotillo. So that's a pretty big deal. We have this discussion about how to pronounce it. I've been calling it like a Komodo. Uh, think like the Komodo and you call dragon. It like a Komodo. Like a Komodo yeah. dragon. That's what. That's okay. how I see it. Yeah. A Komodo yeah, dragon. Komodo. It sounds like you're saying. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that I get that right. Because when you is, said is Komodo, it a, is, it a, <laughs> is it a dragon in a kimono? Is that how I pronounce it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> when I heard you say that on the far side, I was like, oh god. Uh. Komodo. I, I don't fucking know. I just... Look, it's dead. That tells it fucking matters. And there isn't a lot of them in the game. Uh, Test has a bunch of them, but... Uh, losing one's expensive. I mean, they can go up to 300 billion isk for the hull just to, to get the BPC and to build one. And and they can be very expensive. The blueprint alone is over 200, I think. Yeah, it's expensive. Yikes. And it requires a Leviathan hull. You already have to have a Leviathan... Uh, which is one of the more expensive titans right now. Um, and also... Uh, also, ahead, Scooter, sorry. three years. Holy shit. Holy uh, Scooter shit. just uh, resubbed for... Potato, potato. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Congratulations, so yeah, that, Scooter, with your three-year subscription. That is uh, something interesting we noticed. So, uh, shout out to the guy that looked that up and found that out, because that's a big deal. That, 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 it, that took it from being one titan and a few supers to it, guaranteed two titans including one faction one. So, uh, Real quick, uh, speaking of things that we've talked about previously that have just now popped up in the last little bit, um, is that I have a picture to share with you guys. This is uh, directly from E Vegas. Uh, this just arrived in the guy's lap today, so he wanted to... He posted a Reddit thread about it. Uh, but they had a silent auction at Vegas. We didn't really talk about this too much. Uh, and one of the crown jewel pieces sold for $2,500 uh, was this. This is a artistic piece of work, uh, and I've, I have to find the artist's name real quick. Resorian. 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 Yeah, that's it. It's called the Ghost of a Nyx, and it is beautifully done. Uh, if you get the image off of uh, the guy took a really good high definition photo, you can zoom in, and it is absolutely beautiful. I don't know about the twenty five hundred dollar price tag, because goddamn for a for an Eve thing that's pretty expensive. Um, but yeah, for charity, it's, from what it, I understand. Yeah. Oh, it did go to charity. Oh, yeah, then definitely worth it. But that is that is just beautiful. Uh, I am a Knicks fan. I love the Knicks. It used to remind me of the uh, Millennium Falcon whenever I flew it, and you could tell they got some pieces from that. Uh, so yeah, that is just absolutely amazing. Yeah, also, like if you were in Vegas, you got to see it in person, and like it, like it's oh, not I just like it. it's it's big, right? Oh like, yeah, this is, this picture does no it's, justice. It's massive, yeah. Yeah, it's quite significant in terms of size. So it's a, it's an amazing piece. Rosorian is a fantastic artist. He has done yeah. a lot of uh, a lot of good work, uh, off and on for INN and various other, uh, various other Eve related websites. So you've, I'm almost certain you guys have seen his stuff. Uh, he takes great screenshots and is just extremely talented. So. Oh, I also want to point out uh, this just got dropped in my lap. We were talking about the horde thing. Um, that horde Sutio wreck was looted by horde freighter alts that were in goons. And the cool thing is, is that they were telling people, look, we looted it with our freighter, it's nice and safe. And then when Horde freighter alts would show up that weren't goons, they would drop bombers on them and kill them <laughs> and then loot those wrecks. So they were, not only were they killing the freighters coming to loot, they were looting it themselves with their own Horde freighter pilots. And then they were getting the guys who died kicked, saying they were goon alts who were trying to sneak away because they would tackle them with horde characters and be like look it's a goon alt that that sounds a lot like lying and i'm not sure i'm comfortable with that because that's just oh, deception please. and that's bad <laughs> it says say this i got nothing oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, final praetorian thank you for your seven months i appreciate it. uh this next one say this might come up your alley you you tend to work with um in in the realm of uh convincing people that the Imperium is the their favorite home and they should join us. Uh, and just recently, Pandemic Legion is kind of falling apart. <laughs> and, I, and I mean falling apart in, in a way that you're starting to see people leave that you would never expect to leave Pandemic Legion, and you're starting to see people join Pandemic Legion that you never thought was possible. And this week we had Northeastern SWAT, uh, kind of fell Cascade, and all its active members went and joined other corps in Pandemic Legion. And then they left... 
And then you have Black Omega Security, a group in, in, in EVE that I never thought would ever don the name Pandemic Legion, has joined Pandemic Legion with its members. So, uh, Sadis, what do you think about this? Well, I think if you look around the universe right now and the galaxy overall, there's a lot of people looking for a home. There's some people who I never thought would approach us who are knocking on our door. So it doesn't surprise me that over in Pandemic Legion, where they're having a, I would say, a crisis of identity and leadership in terms of what their secession plan is going to be and all that. They do have a name. They do have some infrastructure. They have a, a fairly large force. People from all the alliances that are getting, I'm going to use a very technical term here, shit canned all over the northeast and all over the north and in many places in the east are looking for stable homes and if they think they can find that stable home in pandemic legion i don't i'm not surprised that they're trying to go there i'm a little bit surprised that they're dipping to some of those levels to take on new members but i guess uh, they have to water the wine at some point i think uh you know the black omega security thing doesn't surprise me that much uh namely because uh it seems clearly related to mercenary coalitions saying that they were giving up their space and their sov and going and marauding and doing whatever it is that they're going to be doing uh and black omega security is of course uh suis's thing and uh he's primarily interested in building stuff and having sov and they've been sitting as uh, quarren's pointed out in chat uh boss has been sitting in that one constellation just yeah. producing super caps and stuff in tribute for ever right look Since, I, uh, I will be before the casino war I, I will be the first to say this but black omega security is all about suits making money out of eve right like we we have logs from years now of him when he was involved with the i want is group and dumping trillions uh in rmt and openly talking about how he made so much money uh the same thing with when he was doing um What's that group before I want us that was doing the casino gambling? Did he? Well, specifically, the one thing that I'm going to say because accusing people of RMT is uh, potentially a dodgy thing to do, but we do have <laughs> logs. That oh yeah, we have the logs during this, yeah. the casino war of uh, specifically of Suez talking about how he'd been banned by CCP for yeah. RMT and for complaining Sonder about Blake, it and yeah. stuff like that. Uh, that was the one. So. Uh, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm not making baseless accusations. He he had openly talked about how he lost trillions. Uh, when they reversed yeah. his accounts with Sonder Blink. Uh, but the question, I guess, leads us to, to I mean, Wibla, TNT has a very, like, small, tight-knit group. Uh, kind of like what I would think of maybe a PL would be, like a group that doesn't really take in a lot of uh, relatively well-known uh, corpse. What do you think about the way, like, PL is just almost dragging the bottom of the barrel here? They are certainly the drain. And they're basically trying to get corpses corpse with fresh people in them that they can latch on to to keep their members safe. But um, DBRB, uh, go on. one of the things that we were so successful at coming out of the north was increasing our numbers so that we could build an economic engine. So in a situation where most of the dance partners you want to take are already taken, don't they have to pick the hottest girl when the ugly lights come on at the bar? Is that the situation they're in right now? No. <laughs> No, I'm sorry. I, I just well, don't. I don't know about that. I, I think that it's a it's a curious situation because, uh, you know, the core identity of a group like Pandemic Legion for years was being the high end raiding guild equivalent yeah. of Eve Online, and you guys have heard me say this many times before. But because Eve changed with the introduction of skill injectors, and you no longer had to be part of an elite organization to get a hold of and use a Titan, uh, there's not too much of a unique selling point to players uh, to join an entity like PL. Uh, PL and NC Dot previously were uh, a draw because they were one of the only organizations that had enough Titans and critical mass to be able to use Titans and supers with impunity. Uh, and now Test and the Imperium can do it just fine. Sorry, Legacy and the Imperium can do it just fine. So uh, the question of what is PL? Like, what are they? What is their purpose? What yeah, is their identity? No identity yeah. What do they do? And, and that's just a big question mark. And nobody has really stepped in to say, I'm leading PL, I'm doing this, this is who we are, this is what we do. Uh, and not having a purpose is really dangerous. If you've got a good purpose, you can go through thick and thin, you can go through like a casino war, you can lose all your space uh, and come out of it stronger culturally and organizationally. Uh, but even in the best of times, if you don't have a purpose, 
uh, you know, it, we see that it's toxic for organizations. And that, that's sort of my take uh, on the PL thing is it's not so much yeah. that PL specifically has a drama problem or something or other like that. It's just more that they have kind of lost their identity. And that's just we're seeing the, someone uh, some of that. someone that quit the game posted in the red thread that same thing that was from Northeastern SWAT. And he said, you're at the point now where almost all of Eve zero zero mega alliances are on the same level when it comes to Titans and supers and alliance level construction, like of what makes up the alliance. Uh, in terms of ships, but it comes down to your leaders and the toxicity levels. And PL has been having some very serious issues over the last few years of just pure toxicity, where people just don't want to deal with the leadership. Especially Doom Chinchilla. His name came all over the thread when NASW announced on Reddit they were leaving. So it's one of those things where, oh, hey, Killer B, how's it going? He might know a thing about how toxic PL can be, because he's an NC dot now. Uh, but that's like the thing. It's like, when you have so many other options, hell, even joining um, Pandemic Horde, they have Titans they're using and throwing around like, like they're candy. Like, why would you join a PL and have to deal with toxicity when you can go join Horde or you can go join NC Dot or any of these other groups? I think I saw them recruiting an English recruiting channel in Cheetah the other day. Wow. No, I, no, I didn't. That's a lie. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wait a second here, dude. What the heck? I, th I thought it was just a, like a little pre-Vegas drama, and I don't want to get too far into the whole Doom Chinchilla thing, but that is a good example of like toxic leadership. There was drama within Pandemic Legion about uh, Doom. There was drama about Headliner blowing up a Rorqual, which inspired somebody to like rip all the rigs off their keep stars and steal a whole bunch of shit. Uh, it was kind of funny to see Doom Chinchilla tweeting about how he had received people said mean things about him, and so he wasn't going to come to Vegas and blah, blah, blah. And... <laughs> You know, it was just kind of like, you know, if he spent 30 minutes sitting in my chair, like, he'd be crying in the corner in the fetal position, right? Yes, Like, the kind exactly. of things that uh, most Alliance leaders have dealt with uh, on a daily basis for, in some cases, more than a decade are, uh, you know, it's one of, it was one of those, like, aw, kids these days, like, you know, it's kind of like <laughs> a, a snowflake kind of thing. Wibla might know uh, a thing or two about that, right, Wibla? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Man. Uh, and then uh, moving on, um, we had a major battle go down. Um, we are going to have a surprise guest in about a few minutes. He said he'd be here at the 30 minute of, of the hour. Um, so we'll have a surprise guest to come chat with us. Uh, but there was a recent battle going down in Losec. Uh, Snuffbox has uh, recently left the, uh, the Imperium and gone back to its Losec roots. And in the process of doing so, got kind of beaten, uh, which is rare to see Snuffbox lose uh but snuffbox lost a fight in low sec recently uh to a group of siege green uh low sec and a and a couple other people like shoot first now they call him low sec voltron uh but snuff tried to fight the solo game uh and it was a nice 200 billion s dread brawl uh and then i have another link which uh inn's going to be doing an article about this so if you want to uh watch for inn they're going to do a little expose on this guy uh, but a very uh, uh, long-time lawn pilot and friend of mine uh, named Andrew Zotti quit the game recently. Uh, and one of the ways he quit the game was he gave away his Titans to a bunch of lawn people. Uh, he is uh, doing some other, like, charity work for lawn that's going to be public here in the future. Uh, and then he also wanted to take his Erebus on a roaming op. So uh, we, we, we got together some carriers and dreads. <laughs> we went on Suicide Roam uh, through Catch. And uh, Test finally realized... That we had a titan there and dropped the hammer and it was glorious and we all died. It was a lot of fun and he was very uh, appreciative of that. So uh, watch RNN. There will be an article coming out about him pretty soon uh, about why he is, you know, what he did and everything. So I thought that'd be cool to share. I thought that was neat. Like, I do yeah. like it when people, uh, you know, if they're going to quit the game, uh, you know, I thought it was neat of him to be like, let's go out with a bang and, you know, basically throwing, throwing a, hey guys, I'm going to turn this Titan into, uh, into a lost man. Well, what's, let's just have some what's great about it is that it's gotten to the point now where people are starting to realize just how wealthy the Imperium is because our suicide ops are literally capitals. <laughs> so no longer are they rifters. I remember a time when you had to take frigates out and now you just do a broadcast and 80 capitals show up to go roaming around the game. 
That's uh, something we want to encourage too much because the no, whole no, like course. let's just suicide our capitals. No, thing, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I don't, I, I don't want to praise it too much in public. I, I think, I think it's amusing if you're like quitting the game, yeah. and I'm glad to hear that he had also like given away some of his <laughs> other titans. Because if yeah. you're going to quit the game and you only have one titan, for God's sakes, just give it to somebody else. Oh yeah, that's what I told. I tried to convince him to donate his titan there, to there, someone. There are some poor people in Delve who are new who have no titans. Think of them and think of the children. Well, they need exactly. Titan. Speaking of that, uh, I heard a rumor that Titan prices are down around thirty billion for a, an Erebus. So if you're looking to buy one, now is the best time. See your local capital what? producer in Dell for that information. When you say down thirty billion, no, do like you mean thirty like billion, 30 billion in mineral cost. Thirty billion. That's it. Yeah, that's actually correct. To give you an idea, fucking super cheap. Yeah, to give you an idea, a fully badass fit Nyx used to be thirty billion, and now you can get an Erebus hole for around thirty billion. Well, thirty six. Are we talking about like Delve pricing here or Galaxy yeah. price? Delve pricing. Using Delvor to build the Titans, we're able to take part in economies of scale. <laughs> <laughs> A little visit there from the Grand Nagus. It works. That's fantastic. Yeah, uh, we are we are basically seeing sort of a galactic, well, not a galactic, a, a Delve-based baby boom of uh, yeah. of Titans in the aftermath of the Northern campaign. Uh, everybody pretty much came back and has been crabbing relentlessly, and uh, you know, there's just a lot of uh, buns in the. Yeah, there. Um, when we were at Vegas, um, we didn't really talk about this much last week, but when we were at Vegas, a lot of people were like. Oh, the North burning or fighting themselves or like when Tri didn't build up its infrastructure, we talked about this a couple months back, uh, wasn't going to hurt them. But now you're starting to see it. Like this guy points out, Esoteria is $65 billion for a Ragnarok. Uh, Ragnaroks and Delve, I think, are 38 <laughs> So you're seeing the effects of what happens when your infrastructure is built up and you put the effort behind it. You're starting to see just how cheap minerals can be. It's actually cheaper uh, I, I'm just recently buying my own avatar. Uh, I'm spending about a hundred thousand isk a unit less on ore in one DQ one than I would be buying it in Jita, and that's going to end up saving me. I think I priced it in Jita at fifty six billion, and I'm going to be spending about thirty two in Delve. So it's, it's it's crazy. It's the importance of executing on a long term plan, and the excellence of execution there has actually worked out really well for us. Yeah. Shout out this to... This stuff is uh, crazy. Yeah, so uh, to give you an idea, I, I'm trying to find the link as we were talking here. A guy recently put up a contract for 10 Nixes at $125 billion. That's $12.5 billion a hull. And the fact that he's selling them in bulk to the nearest buyer <laughs> made me just lose my shit. 10 fucking Nixes in one contract uh, for $125 billion was just... Absolutely Hell's amazing. Twelve point five. That's nuts. Yeah, because, yeah. Hell's and Nixes are that cheap. We have we have one guy in Karma Fleet. He started about a year and a half ago, and he's up to three supers ratting all the time, making many billions. Yeah, an, an hour. He's it's kind of funny. To give you an it's idea, crazy. I mean, if you have three workloads, which is about the going average in Delve right now, you're making a about a three quarters of a billion an hour. So you can have yourself a brand new super carrier in one good weekend of mining. So from a certain perspective, the leverage of the Delve Titan unit is only increasing because it's not just that people are able to make money in Delve, but the relative cost of goods is continuing to decrease. Oh, they're, they're, it's plummeting. Are... It's the cheapest it's ever been. Yeah. yeah. And it's only going to so... go down more because, like Satis points out, the more that pe like you're seeing people now, instead of going out and ratting in a carrier, they're ratting in a Nix because it's... You're going to make your money back before no, the thing oh, dies. Oh, they're ratting in three Nixes. Oh, yeah, I can't do that, so I don't... I, fuck that shit. That's too complicated. Well, they know, they know how to play the game, Nixes. so it's okay. Very intensive. Darkshides, tell us. What do you mean? I'm trying to control fighters over three Nixes. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a lot of bloody effort. <laughs> it's it's like playing whack-a-mole on speed. Oh, dude, it, you have to be like a... Uh, you have to be like a StarCraft uh, pro gamer to be able to pull that off, like... Just the amount of micromanagement on one Nix is fucking nuts. I have a hard time with it. Uh, but but that's the whole point, is you're seeing people now, again, with skill injectors, if you get enough money saved up, 
Uh, thank you for that link, sir. Uh, the Delve Time Unit uh, it's probably needs to be updated. But there's the uh, image of that. Um, but you're starting to see a point now. Oh, sorry. That's the sound of my Is that an ice cream truck? No, that's my washer machine. <laughs> it's this amazing washer machine. It makes that great noise. Um, I want to ice cream. <laughs> but you're starting to see now where if a guy's got enough oracles out there and he's you know making it, you can do an hour a day. And in a month's time, he's like, okay, I want to buy myself a, a Titan. And now he's got himself a Titan. And you're starting to see that. And it's it's something I don't think the game was prepared for. Because no longer does he have to just buy the Titan. He can go buy the skill injectors for the Titan, too. And he's got his Titan and, his, and uh, the skill injectors. And it used to be there was that, that character limit. Only a select amount of characters had saved up enough SP to get the Titan. And put the investment towards the Titan. Because you never bought the Titan skill book until you were ready to fly the Titan. Now you have people who will just inject it. And like, okay, in a couple months, I'll own the Titan. I'll get it then. Yeah, um, it used to be it used to be the meme that if you were in a Titan or a Super, you're in a coffin. But now that's just something you can inject to. So it's a completely different meme. Yeah. <laughs> and you can also park them in Fort or Keep Stars. You can just you know, I, I think probably stuff. the single biggest change culturally in EVE happened. And it, it kind of surprised me at the time. The, going back to... I'm just going to loop this back around to the Pandemic Legion and the Elite Alliance's cultural shift stuff, because it, it's shocking to me how little they resisted the idea of skill injectors, because skill injectors was uh, the thing that broke down the barrier between new players and people who had been playing the game for years and had the time and inclination to start training a Titan character that would potentially take two years plus to train into. Uh, and now we're really seeing here, technically speaking, the rest of EVE could be doing exactly the same thing that we're doing in the Imperium. Uh, you can see that the Legacy Coalition is catching up, uh, not like Boo, Scary Boo, we need to be worried about it, but like they are also playing the game the way it has been designed by actually like mining their moons. And meanwhile, a lot of the old elite alliances that are no longer so elite because of the presence of ejectors uh, are refusing to actually mine moons or do the work or set up this kind of economic infrastructure uh, yeah. to create the kind of military forces you need. And it, it seems like we see periodically these threads on our EVE and various other places where uh, people who are just used to feeling entitled to have income handed to them on a platter in the form of passive R64 income are, are just howling about the fact that they don't want to do any work. To PvP, they want to they well, want to change the game back to uh, handouts. I, that's another meta shift too that I don't think that these elite PvP groups like appeal are ready for, is that you have to have enough member base to be able to do the farming and the PvP. PL was gotten to a point where I think uh, someone pointed out, I think it was maybe it was NC dot, that they were five boxing just to be able to have a sub cap, a fax, and a titan on the field at the same time. You had people who were having to do all of the work that we could just get five individual pilots to do. Um, and five more back at home making money. And it's gotten to the point now where having the Mega Alliance makes your alliance function, I think. I think the numbers thing, though, is, is probably quite unique to a group like mm -hmm. that. Like in, in the initiative, for example, uh, you know, we have to have, like what PL done, like you've got your sub... You've got your cap, you've got your uh, super cap, your titan. Like you have to have those alts if you want to uh, to can to compete. I guess. I gotta ask. Yeah, but but dark shines. We have that in the Imperium too. We just have say one person in a fax, and the rest are actually out making money. I have to ask though, dark shines. And in, in smaller alliances have found ways to supplement uh, their money making. Uh, I believe you guys do this, where you have like uh, where you dedicate during wartime one whole day to making money where everyone just kind of goes home makes a bunch of money and then you continue the war the six other days is that still a thing or uh no that's relatively new it was something we only had kind of come across with the six rcq campaign and x7 one before that because I mean, you have to give people a break so it was kind of like five days on two days off and uh it, it worked i guess sounds like a job yeah, it, mm -hmm. it's a good it's a good way to solve I think the number problem, right? Because then you uh you have your ability to protect your people who are making money on that day. You could say, okay, everyone go make money, we'll we'll protect you, uh, and then you can go back to doing your thing. Uh, we were supposed to have a guest uh, to tell us all about what's going on in the north, uh, but he's not here. 
and I don't know where he is. So I'm, he told me he'd be here at the 30 minute mark. It is past the 30 minute mark, so who knows? But we can go well, ahead and go into, jump into this. We're going to go into cool kids only mode uh, here in about three minutes. But yeah, the the north is a, and so that's we do this every meta show for people who are new. Uh, we go to subscribers only mode at the 45 minute mark, and then people who are subscribers can ask questions, and we'll try to answer those questions or comments. Yeah, yeah. The north is a hot mess, uh, basically, as is the east. Like fraternity and tri are like going at it. Tri seems to be having some implosion issues. Uh, the North is just turning on each other with a long knife. Uh, do we have somebody here that is uh, would consider themselves to be expert enough to discuss the Northern situation? I was going to. I didn't know. If... Oh, go for it. Yeah, so uh, I've been monitoring this because, again, um, I don't get to play EVE as much as I'd like coming up in the next few months. So I've been watching the, the metagame of it all. And it looks like... It's an interesting hot mess. So you have uh, Pandemic uh, Horde and Black Legion fighting against GOTG in the north. Uh, just a couple of days ago, there was a mega form-up CTA on both sides. Uh, Horde telling its Titan pilots, get ready to die. Uh, GOTG telling its Titan pilots, we're going all in. That became nothing. Um, uh, it was in CZGJ, which is a staging system for GOTG. A Fortis are belonging to Pandemic Horde online without question. They kind of blue balled each other, even though they had kept telling everyone that we're all going to die. It's going to be this big fight. Uh, it seems to be kind of a face off, uh, and it's a weird situation because on one hand, you have Horde openly and vocally screaming from the hilltops, "We're here to take Branch. We're here to kick GOTG out of Branch," but they're not doing it. They're occasionally getting a good fight in. They're occasionally hitting uh, a target here, a target there. But you're not seeing these uh, big knockout, drag-out fights anymore that you would expect um, from the North. Like, if you have all these Titans in place, you have all these people fighting, you would think there's uh, this big fight going on. Right after the meta show uh, last week, uh, you had to go. Uh, but we ended up extending the show two hours. The, the first hour after you left was the uh, State of the Alliance for... Darkness, we listened in on that, sort knew we were live streaming it, so he took questions and answers from Twitch chat, the uh, 900 people that were watching, uh, and then eventually, uh, we got all the parties involved to come on the comms, uh, with, with Vili, myself, Kate Color, and, and Jay moderating, uh, <laughs> we got uh, Sword on, we got uh, Alpha Star Pilot, who's the FC for Horde, he came on, and there was a lot of uh, shit flinging back and forth between those two, that was fun to watch. Uh, I think Alpha Star Pilot at one point was like, bring it on, I dare you. Uh, which was pretty cute coming from a guy who's relatively new to the, the FC game. Uh, and then uh, this week alone, there's been a lot of movement of players. So Pandemic Hor uh, Horde was getting assistance from PL Supers. Uh, but I got told a couple days ago, uh, this would be uh, Thursday now, uh, that Pandemic Legion's looking to move into Geminit to assist Horde at home uh, against the Scourge that is... Uh, space violence. Uh, apparently space violence has been causing some havoc there, so it looks like that might be happening. Uh, and not to discuss future plans, because, I mean, I'm not, I don't have a say in this. Uh, I've been told Test is fully deploying its whole alliance as of Sunday. Um, and rumors that is going to land on the shores of Geminit uh, is like a 90% guarantee. So, uh, that's the situation in the north. It's a fucking hot bed of mess. Everybody's fighting each other. NC seems to be staying out of it, though. We, we kind of expected this big Mega Brawl to happen a couple days ago that NC would side with P. Horde, but they didn't really even show up, so uh, it'll be interesting to see. We also had uh, NC. Reset GO2G. Uh, that was a big ticket item uh, last week that happened on Sunday, uh, right after the meta show, obviously, we were uh, talking about it. Uh, according to Killer B, uh, he might confirm this in chat if I get this wrong, but he said that he's tired of thinking in terms of a coalition. And no longer wants to do that. And he wants to think in terms of what's best for NC Dot. Uh, <laughs> and to not, you know, get political. But it sounds like uh, a lot of real life countries are doing that now. Where they're like, yeah, we care about our country. We want to think about our country. Fuck everyone else. It sounded like that was what he was oh. saying. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. But that's seriously. That's I mean, he said that. He said, look, it, it got straining. It got... Dr draining to have to think about the coalition and i just want to think about NC. I mean, that's just bullshit though i mean like that's the thing about this whole coalition <laughs> thing is that uh it, the the north has never really had like strong leadership like they don't have a centralized command structure 
and they always had this hypocritical attitude about yeah. being in a coalition. They would accuse us of having too many blues or being a blue donut, while they themselves actually had like more population than us when they were all put together. Uh, but because they never had strong central leadership or a unified culture, it was this motley collection of people who weren't uh, in the Imperium and weren't in Legacy, uh, there's really nothing holding them together. So when we withdrew, then it's not a surprise that all the long knives came out uh, and that they've turned on each other. because. Even in these big fights, one of the reasons why I think the Imperium did so well uh, in the campaign in the North is that in the middle of these big fights, you would see these incidents where these supposed allies in this supposed coalition uh, were turning on one another, like yeah. CO2 giving orders during X-47 to de-aggress their Titans such that they wouldn't lose any more Titans after they realized that we were targeting them uh, and not telling uh, the other members of the coalition that they were doing that. Uh, so... You know, when you have a whole bunch of backstabbers and crabs in a bucket together, it's not really a shock that uh, yeah. uh, they they end up with a lot of uh, crab juice everywhere. I guess yeah. I one know. of the and and oh, mittens. Min they were they they were always the coalition of the well paid. And as soon as they they stopped getting paid, really, what kept them together disappeared. So with darkness making the deal and CO Tufus heading over to. Uh, wherever the heck they are. I think they're in the drone lands now. Yeah, the drones, yeah. It's obvious that they're, they're going to be fighting over the vacuum. And they can't go back to the structures that they've dealt with for multiple years. So there's all of those little issues that they had with each other that were always paved over by trillions and trillions of ISK. Now that doesn't exist. We punch them in the nose. And they're like, you can't punch us in the nose. And then they look to Big Brother and Big Brother's not helping them. Of course they're going to fight. And it's fantastic. And I love seeing it. Yeah, another big uh, key here to notice um, from the way Killaby talked about it is three months ago, maybe four months ago, uh, Billy pointed this out after the show was over, you had a, a verifiable command structure. You had Vince Draken running the show for a lot of groups. For example, try getting involved with War on Test was a Vince Draken push. Hey, try, go fight them. You're doing what I say. Now... Four months on, there is no Vince Drake. He's AFK. He's gone. And you don't have that central leader holding everything together, like the, the, the central cog in the wheel, uh, making everything work. And they just don't have it. They don't have anyone that wants to do it. Like Killer B said, he doesn't want to do it. And they don't have anyone stepping up to take control. And so you have a situation like Pandemic Horde, who's being let loose of their leash to do whatever they want. And they're causing more problems for the whole North than we could have ever done. Yeah, I think it's just kind of curious to see. Um, well, I don't want to interrupt it. Let's put it like that. I, yeah, I, like... <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know how I don't know how it's going to play out. But uh, it, it's just uh, you know, there, there's such a power vacuum there. At the end of the day, before when Pandemic Legion was more active and when Vince was more active, uh, PL and NC Dot used to be PL uh, would keep the entire thing in order, right? Uh, yeah, you had adults the day, in the room. They would say, yeah, you had to do what they said if you were in that coalition. Uh, and PL is in such a uh, sort of a dire place as far as the leadership vacuum yeah. goes. Uh, there's nobody around to uh, to bring order. I, I want to use uh, this example because yeah. I'm a teacher, right? It's like if I left the room of my second graders uh, while we were doing something really important, but had a camera running to look at what was going on, it would be chaos. You'd have kids eating glue, throwing pencils, It'd be just a mess. Maybe they would still do their job if I did my job right. But there's a very good real chance that some of those kids are going to lose it, right? And that's what it feels like in the, in the North now. Vince has stepped out of the room. Uh, PL doesn't really have an Elise around anymore. Elise has been kind of AFK. Uh, he, sh he hangs out and stuff, but he's not really running the show. Uh, and so you have nobody who's in charge. And then now you have a group like with Gobbins going, well, let's see how much shit I can get away with before someone slaps me back into place. But it's also it's also a difficult thing when you have a group that's led by one person or a cult of personality type thing, or they don't have a bureaucracy type setup. If someone is coming up through that and they're one of the second tier people who still has a lot of energy and drive to lead a coalition, it's tough for them to step up because there's inertia holding them back. Yeah. So in many cases, I'm not sure that those types of structures are going to be able to make the metaphor metamorphosis they need to do in order to survive long term right i it's almost like a mega corporation without a ceo and no board of directors 
Uh, we have a board of directors, so I mean, not to say this is bad, but if Mitt has ever just said, fuck it, I'm done, there'd be someone to take the reins and some strong figurehead to come in behind him and a, and a, a coordinated group to keep the, the show going, right? Whereas Mittens, in the North... <laughs> do not leave. <laughs> yeah, don't leave. Don't no, question but, to but, but you know what I mean, though. Like, you have a system in place that's designed to have the next person step up. You look at our FC team that's done that way. There's always the next guy, just in case. Um, and I think that's the problem in the North. It's allowing a person like Elo. Uh, by the way, Elo was supposed to be on the show right now. He hasn't showed up and replied. Uh, he replied an hour ago saying, look, I'll come on. Uh, I'm going to be late. But... You, you depended upon Elo. <laughs> yeah. That seems to be a mistake but... that Gobbins is making in the game currently. But here's the thing that I think the North is making the mistake of, and maybe, Wibla, you can have an input on this. Letting a guy like Elo run uh, rough shot on everyone in the North, gobbling up the talent that he wants, does not look like a good idea to have that kind of a person free to like get in the ear of Pandemic Horde or get in the ear of PL. It just does not feel like that would work. No, I think it would be hilarious. This, uh, you go. You sorry, Wibla. Yeah, sorry. Oh, you have this combination of a one-two punch where you have uh, no cohesion internal in the north, and then you have Elo adding to the well, adding insult to injury and hovering up any, anyone he wants and basically kicking everyone else as he wants. So it's uh, interesting times in the north right now. I'm glad I'm not there. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's sort of a, a classic talent harvest, really. Like what uh, yeah. Elo is. Doing. PL used it's to the... do this. Like this is something PL used to be good at. But PL would go do it against, like, a Brave. Or they would go do it against enemies. It, it honestly feels like the talent harvest is happening within. And Elo is the guy doing it. Like, he's snuck inside all of these groups. And he's pulling from inside rather than pulling from outside like PL used to do. PL, Yeah, so, uh... I don't know what else to say about that. That's kind of just a hotbed of mess, and I'm glad I'm not involved. Well, I'm, I'm sure that Gobbins will see this opportunity in the power vacuum and step up to show himself to be a true autocrat and not merely a PL functionary that was simply put in front of their meat shield corp. I'm sure that this is the opportunity for Gobbins to step up as the true leader of the Northern <laughs> Bloc in the absence of a Vince or of a Elise. And uh, that, uh, you know, this is it. Uh, he gets a, to have a seat at the big boys table like a proper autocrat and, uh, impress us all with his leadership and guidance and cool in a crisis <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry but uh goblin's about is about as strong of a leader as tommen is in the game of thrones <laughs> no to put up with as much as he puts up with you know there there's some leadership skill there we don't always agree with it but you know you don't get to the what? level that he's at without you know he, he leads a large coalition. There's got to be some leadership skill there. We don't agree with it. We don't like it. But how could you put up with that many screaming chimpanzees if you didn't have some ability to organize them? <laughs> oh, well, like just a, yeah. well, he I doesn't mean, have to deal with them. them. If, you, if, you see, if you see your line members as like customers at a McDonald's, I think it makes it easier because you just don't care as much. At I, least that's no, my like, understanding of, uh, <laughs> of the hoard management system. Not even McDonald's. I would say like Walmart. Like He's one of the, the big five leaders of the Walmart chain, and he never interacts with any of the people who do the day-to-day -day stuff. He's got people below him. Uh, who have openly said that Gobbins is never around, that they have to kind of, like, manage the show. And he said as much when I talked to him. It's like he has no idea what goes on the day-to-day -day inside of Horde. So when you don't have to deal with that, of course you could be uh, an, a leader in absentee that, that keeps the glue together. He doesn't have to do much. Oh. I guess that, I guess that would work in a system where Pandemic Legion was strong, so he just needed to be a placeholder because he never right. actually had to do anything in terms of real direction, right? Pandemic Horde would just do whatever the people. He'd have to make the decisions. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, above Gobbins in the hierarchy. So, yeah, hmm, curious. Yeah, this is a very curious thing because it's uh, this is just getting started. Like winter's coming. Uh, there's a giant fucking wave of winter coming his way, uh, and the North is either going to right itself and there's going to be a leader that steps up and takes control and the thing is going to fix itself or it's going to fall apart and the last like everyone that's ever lived in the north eventually it dies it seems like a curse uh northern coalition fell apart and had the you know they just died uh we lost the north moved to the south 
uh, and we lost a bunch of people in our group. And then the same thing's happening in the North right now, where they're fracturing and falling apart. And it's either they're going to fix it or they're going to die. Yeah. All right. Well, I haven't seen any, any actual questions really in the, the chat for the cool kids. And you guys don't have to ask questions if you don't feel like it. But I want to remind folks that uh, I am can, looking at the yeah. chat when we go into uh, what was the first MMO? Sadus is uh, Sadus was the first MMO. Oh, can, can we talk about that real quick before we go? What? Did you watch uh, BlizzCon or hear about BlizzCon? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the Diablo 3 thing, I mean, the uh, oh Diablo God. mobile thing, I, I don't understand, like, mobile, like, from a business perspective, mobile gaming is such a huge market, and you might have an yeah. audience of primarily, like, PC gaming nerds at BlizzCon, but the idea of Blizzard having a mobile game, when they don't really have that many besides Hearthstone, and Hearthstone paved the way for that, it makes tons yeah. of money, it's great on a yeah. mobile platform, uh, and everybody's like, oh my god, they're putting a Diablo thing on mobile, it's like, the shocking thing to me is, why they haven't done it before because regardless yeah. of like faction uh, regardless of like platform factionalism or something uh they should be taking their ip into the mobile market to make tons of money while people are commuting it's just it just makes good sense yeah, this, business. it's good sense uh, for making money but what was big about this was there were leaks from inside uh blizzard and for the last year or so about a huge diablo mmo-esque game coming to replace Diablo 3, and that this BlizzCon was going to be the announcement of it. And so you had tens of thousands of people who would have never gone to BlizzCon show up, including a couple big Twitch personalities who were going to stream there and waiting for that big Diablo announcement. And then that big Diablo announcement ended up being a Diablo mobile game. <laughs> it was so great. So great. I think you can't announce something like that at a... Uh... You know, a convention where it's mainly PC gamers, right? Like it's just. Well, yeah, and then the I think the question was asked: uh, Do you ever plan on putting this on PC for the people who just won't do mobile? And they said, Yeah, no, we don't have any intention of doing that, and that's not good. Like when you tell the entire audience that are mostly PC enthusiasts, that's just not going to happen. Like if they had a PC port where a bunch of PC guys could play it and enjoy it and experience the game, I'm sure they would have been no problems. But I'd love to, you know know what the uh, i think wyatt was his name the the guy who was uh, presenting it yeah I would, he... <laughs> I would love to know what his uh couple of days before that presentation were like because he had to know what was gonna happen i felt bad for that guy too like i mean and we're kind of out of time here and we're done with Eve stuff but i i felt bad for that guy because he's one of the lead d3 devs and the company that's making this uh this diablo game is in china like, the Diablo group is not even a part of it. He was just the, the face of the guy that had to go out there and do the talking. <laughs> and you could just hear it in his voice that he sounded like, oh, fuck, what have I done? <laughs> Punishment yeah, like duty. Even, yeah. The answers that they were giving were, you know, complete deflections. It's like, one answer was, well, hey, don't you all have mobile phones? It's like, no, that's not the point. Yeah, aren't you excited to finally play with your mobile phone? It's like, uh... What? I mean, I, I think that one of the things that uh, there's a couple of arguments here, right? Yeah. One of them, and I think Darkshines or Wibla brought it up, I forgot already. Uh, one of our guests brought up that, you know, if you're giving a speech to primarily a PC audience, you should be expecting that maybe this would cause some trouble. Or why would you make that announcement in front of uh, a PC audience? And one of the things that we have seen over the years at FanFests is a lot of times when you have like a big company uh, convention or an event like BlizzCon or like FanFest, uh, a lot of times what the company officials are presenting are aimed at investors uh, and yeah. at uh, people who are either VIPs in the audience or people who are not even there. And it's more of like a corporate communication, even if the local audience there is like, well, this is dumb, we don't care. Uh, and then why would you present that to that audience is because that is the forum that you have to do that. I mean, when okay, we saw um, Helmar going like, hey, there's an EVE mobile game at Vegas last year, everybody was just like, uh, but I, that was, I again, an example. I mean to interrupt, but I need to. Uh, Dark Shines, I know you're here on the show, so you probably just missed this. Uh, but if you uh, meander over to Z-Kill real quick, you're going to see about a bazillion Killmo show up as uh, a fleet of uh, Horde Feroxes. And a fleet of PL uh, Serpuses and Geminit have both just died to bombs at the same time. So it sounds like they all landed together on a nice healthy grid. And surprise, you've been bombed. <laughs> Pando again. 
That's beautiful. Yeah, so it well looks, like a, 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 looks like a SV Goon Sferox fleet uh, has uh, showed up to fight, and then everything else just died. Well, that's, a, that's a positive note for us to end on. So, yes! yeah, no, we are out of, out of time here uh, this week, so thank you all for coming. I'm going to take things out of Cool Kid, and I want to thank our guests for turning up. Oh, awesome. And, yes, thank uh, you, everyone. We will be back next week. Thank you very much. Have a great week, everyone. You too, everyone. See you guys. You are about to receive messages that may be harmful to your mental state. Your sense of reality will be questioned. Your view on things will be altered. You are now part of the meta. The meta controls everything. The meta determines what will and will not happen. You are watching The Meta Show.